Okay, let us go ahead and get ourselves going this morning. Welcome back to session 15 of 120C, 220C. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to get to something which I kind of think is sort of a very practical application of Dynamo. But I want to do something that's a little bit of a contrast. It still involves evaluation and kind of grabbing model data, sort of seeing how it compares to different values we might want to achieve. But it's uh, probably a little more practical than just sort of looking at sort of abstract forms and trying to understand what good forms might look like based on different criteria. We're going to do something where we're going to implement something which just checks against some code requirements. Okay, something very simple. So start with a little building that has some rooms, has some doors, some windows into it, and just kind of check how it's doing against code so that we get a little bit of design advice about where we might need to spend a little bit more attention or kind of just verify how things are changing or as the size of different things change around, you know, do, is everything still adequate for the code requirements? And just as a general principle, this is uh, very useful. There's a lot of things we do to check our architectural designs versus code. We kind of check things like, oh, for the occupancy or egress standpoint, you know, do we have enough doors to kind of handle the number of people that are in the room? And that's determined by the area of the room and what the prescribed occupancy is. So generally, if there's more than 50 people in a room, we need two doors. The other things we can start checking, oh, for example, when it comes to doing lighting or ventilation, we take the area of the room and we say that we want to have a certain amount of lighting, just kind of natural lighting brought into the room. This is independent of the lead requirements. You need to have at least 10% of the floor area to be well, windows or some sort of lighting that can come in. So if you have a 300 square foot room, you need 30 square feet of windows. Okay. From a ventilation standpoint, if you're not going to do it mechanically, you need to be at a 5%. So 300 square feet, you'd need 15 square feet of windows. Okay, or 30 feet, or 30 square feet of, you know, half operable, like uh, double hung windows would work or something like that. So there's a lot of things we can do to sort of just verify are we meeting the requirements. If from an ADA standpoint, you're worried about wheelchair access, we can check the width of the hallways to make sure that they're always at least 36 inches wide. We can check doors to see if any of the doors are less than 32 inches wide. So it's just very practical stuff that you might go ahead and kind of do on top of your model. So that's where we're going to spend the majority of today doing, is really looking at what I call the design of advisor and really evaluating Revit rooms kind of based on some of the different rules we can encode there. Now as a recap, where we were last time was pretty much looking at the whole idea of using list maps, using list maps to go through and exhaustively evaluate a couple of forms. So we looked at how we could go through and vary a form as pairs of values to kind of test some uh, different metrics of how good we think the design or the overall form was. Um, we went ahead and looked at how we could use list maps to vary an overall range of values and sort of pull out values from an advanced analysis tool, like the solar analysis tool. But it was all sort of based on different input parameters and ultimately pulling out different evaluations. And then at some point, you have a bunch of different evaluations. You want to sort of rank those to sort of understand really what you think the most optimal values are, kind of based on the criteria you're trying to optimize by. What we're going to do for the second part of class today is actually switch over to using a different control strategy. So as opposed to list map, which is exhaustively stepping through all the way from the beginning to an ending point, just using the loop to check as we go, are we meeting the criterion yet? And when we finally either meet or break some criteria that we want to set, okay, then we would stop and say, hey, okay, we are going to declare victory. We are at the value that we want to uh, kind of work with. An example of how that might be useful is for example, if you know that you have a cap on the total number of square footage that you can put into a building, you want to try and keep on flexing the form and get it as large as possible but not actually exceed that limit, you can go ahead and try for every group of parameters you want to feed in just how big you can make one of them until you sort of exceed that limit. So that's a high level of what we're doing today. As we get going, Let's just kind of think about an overall strategy for how we're going to approach this. And that wasn't the way to do it. Let me go back and open that up again. If you up there. We're 
did you go? Right back there. Yeah, this is something called Mindomo, which I like. There's, little, there's like mind managers, a bunch of different mind mapping like programs that I like to work with. To me, it's just sort of the easiest way to. Uh... Is it free? Um, what is this? If you're working by yourself, it's free. If you're starting to collaborate with other people and share, then it isn't. Then you know, you pay for like an education account or something like that. But I don't know. It's, it's, it's one that I highly uh, recommend. I, I like mind mapping. I think it's a good way of uh, trying to understand the world. Or at least it's, it's the only way that sort of keeps a structure that's as fluid as my somewhat scattered thought process. <laughs> okay, so as we're getting going, here's the basic roadmap for what we're gonna do. We are going to go through and open a, a Revit model, okay, that has uh, some different rooms in it. And we're also going to go ahead and open an Excel data file. We're going to use these two things together. You're going to find that each of the different rooms has some data. Every room has an occupancy associated with it. It also has a certain area based on the actual physical size of the room. Okay. And the Excel data file is going to put in some target values for each of the different occupancies. We're going to give it a color. We're also going to give it sort of the, what the design loading is for that. So based on the occupancy, it'll be a different loading for each of the rooms. And we're going to use that data to actually go through and compute some things. We're going to start by just going through and doing a nice color map where we colorize the rooms based upon the occupancies. So grabbing some of the Excel file and uh, computing some colors and then associating those to the different rooms in the Revit model. We're also going to go through and use the Excel data to compute the design occupancy. So given the area and the occupancy, how many people we think are reaching those rooms or how much we have to design for. Finally, after we sort of figure out how many people are in each of those different rooms, we'll figure out which of the rooms have more than 50 people in them, and then get a list of the doors for each of those rooms. And then based upon it, whether it is enough doors, if it's greater than two or less than two, we'll highlight the rooms or highlight the doors or the rooms that are inadequate. So we're going to go through and just really integrate together a lot of different things. But to get yourself going, let's go ahead and we'll do two things. Well, a, we'll open up the Revit file and take a look at that. And B, we're going to make sure there's a couple of custom packages installed on your machines that have some useful utilities. In particular, oh, I think a lot of us have been working with Lunchbox or used to sort of Lunchbox or some different functions that are very useful in there. There's another one called Clockwork for Dynamo, which is very handy. And it has some very useful nodes for doing room analysis. So if you give it a list of rooms, it'll find all the doors. If you give it a list of rooms, it'll find all the boundaries, which are the walls, all the windows, things like that. OK, so let's go on over here. And if you can, just open the little design advisor file. So head out to session 15. Let's take a look at that. See what state I left this in. I'm always working with these files right before coming into class, so sometimes they're a little bit odd. Okay, this is uh, the basic idea right now. We have uh, a little space. It's not all that interesting. It's basically a series of offices around what I call like a break room. Let me go ahead and look at it in the floor plan view. You can start to see uh, there's a series of different offices. There's a break room in there. That's kind of looking okay. What's happening is for each of these different offices, um, there's a room associated. So there's that abstract room <laughs> object associated with each of these. If you choose one of them, for example, you'll see that, okay, this is designated as an office. It has a certain occupancy, which is called office. It also has a computed value, an area, okay, which is actually based on the boundaries of that room. So two different things. One thing that we set, and another thing that we uh, are computing. And with rooms, if you go through and change anything, for example, if you go uh, moving the wall out or something like that, for example, if I go dragging this wall out, and just change something or add another boundary, if you want to, you add your own room in here. Just go ahead and try changing things. You'll sort of see the values should all uh, change themselves. Okay, so you can go through and just adjust these things. If you want to add your own room, that's fine. Just go through and put in a wall. Okay, 
Notice that actually, currently, the room tag was sort of in like, uh, I sort of split the space. I'm gonna say move it to the room. It will make it in that room. I'll add another room upstairs there. So I'll add a room right there. Okay, and we need to give this some sort of designation. Uh, occupancy, what do I have available myself in here? Let me just call that, I'll call that a mechanical room. It's not really a very good place for a mechanical room, but just to prove that it is all live somehow, we can do these things. That room doesn't have any doors in it right now. Maybe we should go through and add a door to that too. So just go ahead and add a door in there somewhere. Again, don't worry about this. I'm just sort of playing around to sort of look at the model and understand what we're working with. So the idea is we're going to try and assess this based upon the adequacy of doors that are kind of in those different rooms. Then we'll take a look at it for windows. So that's half the equation right there. The other half of the equation that we're going to look at is an Excel data file. And the Excel data file looks like this. Let me go ahead and open up Excel. If I can find Excel in here. There it is. Don't worry if you don't have Excel on your machine. We could always go through and uh, you'll, you'll, you'll still be able to work with it. Where do I want to see open, 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 open other workbooks? Hey, let me see if I go out. This interface changes so much that it's always confusing to me. Okay, and I'm going to go out to my 120C folder. This should all be sitting inside the folder of uh, stuff that you have. Okay, it's called occupancy load table. And it's not a very interesting table, but it kind of gets to the other side of the equation. We tried writing data values out to Excel. Now we'd like to be able to read them back in too, because it's you'd like to have that fluidity that uh, you sort of adjust our models in either place. Um, you'll see that for all these different designations for occupancy as a name, there's a different load value. And okay, so what this is saying that for every office, we're going to assume there's like one person for every 100 square feet. In the conference room, we're going to assume there's one person for every 15 square feet. The restrooms, they all have different values. These values over here, these RGB values, just colors in terms of uh, producing a nice little color map. But we can load this up with all sorts of different information, or we can even change these occupancy values. If you want to go ahead and use, as opposed to 100, use 120 or something like that, just pop it in here. What we're starting to get to is the idea that data exists in more than one place. It doesn't just exist inside this ex uh, Revit database. It can exist in other places. And we can use that mode to intersect that data and do interesting things. So let me pause there. Does everyone have these two files available to them? Yep. Excellent. OK. Then let's go ahead back over to Revit and load up those two different packages. Just make sure you have those. So if I go back over to Revit, we'll open up Dynamo. And in Dynamo, we're going to start with 1A. That's the part where we're just setting this thing up and oh, getting the Excel model data. So go open up 1A. And as you open up 1A, if some of the nodes aren't there yet, actually, we'll just make sure they're there for everybody. We'll pull some things in. OK, what I would like you to do is look over on the left-hand side of your screen and see if you have both clockwork and lunchbox. And you probably have lunchbox, because a lot of us have put that in there already. If you don't have clockwork yet, or lunchbox, either of those, let's do this. Let's go over to packages and just download those. So good old clockwork. If you're going for clockwork, go for clockwork for Dynamo 0.9.x. Just go ahead and click the down arrow here on the left-hand side. Mr. Andy Dandy has put that out for us. And it's really an incredibly handy group of things. <laughs> I'm done like that. <laughs> it's like, you need a good screen name. If you're going to be putting stuff out there, you need an attractive screen name. 
Okay, so Blockwork, again, it's actually, you see it's over 350 nodes. It's just uh, Andy, <laughs> Mr. Dandy, has put all sorts of stuff out there that is just really incredibly useful little things. And the ones we're going to use are things that are, for example, if we have rooms, it's going to be able to sort of grab you the walls of the rooms, or the windows of the rooms, or the doors of the rooms, or all those sorts of things. Those are things that, um, if you wanted to program that, you could sort of try it out at Dynamo nodes, and you might have to use the Revit API and Python to grab some of that information. Okay, but you sort of went ahead and encapsulated it all to make it a little bit easier for you. So Clockwork is one. The other one is Lunchbox. If you don't have Lunchbox, please go ahead and grab that. It's like Lunchbox for Dynamo. There's only one version of it out there right now. So you can download that and get that installed as of 28 November 2015. Because okay. again, they're just little utility notes. And you pause there for a second and see people downloading or are you finding them or is anyone not finding them and need some help? Which, which version should you download? Um, for Lunchbox, I think it's just the only one. For um, Clockwork, go for the one that says for Dynamo 0.9. Okay, so there. Oh, oh, it's just doing its thing. Excellent. Okay. Super. And the way you know you're successful is if you come back over to the little browser and you kind of clear out any search, you should hopefully see all those guys hanging around over here. If you want to just take a look at the breadth of the library, there's really just an incredible amount of stuff in here. So for things in Revit, all these different utilities. Things about this, the Revit document itself, the Revit application, things about, oh, let's see what else I have in here. Well, let's just try this. The functions we're going to use are all a, a variation of rooms, things that are operating on rooms. So let's just kind of say just rooms and sort of see what's out here. So we have the doors to rooms. We can either go through and get the rooms that are connected by a given door, which might be useful if you have a single door and you want to see what things are on either side of it, or you can get the doors that are connected to a room. Okay, so either way of doing that. Same thing with windows. We can either sort of go ahead and get all the windows associated with the room, or we can get all the, the room, which is associated with the windows. Okay, the room boundaries, that's going to give you the whole notion of really what bounds it. That should be a collection of either walls or room separators. Uh, is unbounded, tells you if there's a room where it's just not sort of bounded on one side. Is point inside, that might be kind of interesting. So some x, y, z point, you can sort of tell whether or not it's inside a room or outside a room. There's lots of stuff kind of hanging out in there. Okay, so let us go ahead and put these to work. So it's all going to start with going ahead and getting some rooms. So let's go ahead and where that little part of the Dynamo graph is, is way up at the top. So see if you can kind of get yourself over to the upper left hand corner. You'll find something which says, let's get all the elements of a certain category. Okay, and we're going to feed it the category rooms. So this can work just as easily for doors or windows or anything like that. So let's just go ahead and start running that and sort of see what we get. We might have to oh, put a watch note on that just so we can sort of see them. As I go looking at that, it doesn't look like there's a preview of the rooms. So let me go ahead and put a little watch on here. We can just get those room elements. Okay, so, so far good. So far good, we are able to grab a bunch of those. That would work just as well for any of the other categories. So for example, if we wanted to drive this just saying, let's go ahead and get all the windows and sort of do something with that independent of the rooms, you could go through and, let me just copy that. And get the window elements just by changing this over here. Windows. Check out all the different things you can get. There's really an incredible number of things, whether it's trusses or structural beams or whatever it is you're after, you can grab them all. And if you say get those, 
and I'll watch those instead. Well, actually, this is going to be interesting. Window for me is an empty list because I don't have any windows in that. Well, we know how to fix that problem really quickly. Let's go off and throw a couple of windows in there. For example, oh, let's come on over here. Well, this is certainly a devoid example. Let's come out here to some windows. I'll just do some nice fixed windows, keep it simple right now. I'll put a window over here in this office. I'll put a window over here in this office. And I'll put a window over here in the mechanical room. Again, don't worry about the architecture too much. I can say, let's go ahead and run that. This one started for me, but it's kind of just hanging. Okay. So. Still running? Yep. That's very strange in terms of you think that would be a very quick operation. Nice. Yours worked. I wonder if it had something to do with me having something done in Revit. Let me get out of like this window placement mode. Oh, there it is. It seems like if I was still in window placement mode, like did you see what I, I still had this whole, uh, this sort of set. It looks like it was pausing and waiting. So when I went back to modify, that kind of cleared its palette. Very good. So I got a list of windows. Um, if we want to, for example, just sort of say, hey, which rooms do those windows belong to? We can do that too. Let's just go ahead and try that sort of room windows. Retrieves all the windows that are associated with the room or the other way. It's really, I want windows rooms. Get the rooms that are connected by a given window. Okay, so what this will do is take that. Now, there's sort of an interesting thing floating around in here. Let's see if, it, I think it'll actually uh, complain to us a little bit. It turns out there is uh, what different phases to your document. Okay, document phase zero, phase one, based upon whether it's existing or new constructions, things like that. So it looks like this wants a little more help in terms of uh, what's going on over here. It looks like I might have to say phase, and I'll say document phases. Okay. Kind of a funny function here. I didn't mean to get into it so early, but what this is going to do is it wants basically a Boolean. It's like true or false. I'm not sure what the Boolean applies though. It implies retrieves all phases in the active document in chronological order. It wants a Boolean, so I'm just going to give it one. Okay, let's run this. I think what's going to happen here is it's going to give us this nice list of phases, phase one and phase three. And I just want to feed it one of those phases. In my case, I'm going to feed it phase three, the latest one, because I think I put them in the latest phase. Okay. So what I need to do is I need to take that list. Okay. Need to get the last item because it only wants a single phase right there. Or it looks like it actually would take a, that's interesting. Looks like it would take multiple phases. Let's try to put plug in that and see what happens. Okay, and then in terms of watching, we can uh, all do the from room. That is the interior room, not the exterior. It looks like you know all windows have an inside and an outside, and they can go between rooms. Let's go and run that and see what that looks like. It's giving me some null right now. I think it's probably complaining just about the phase. So. Let's go ahead and think about that, because I would think that that would actually be OK. Let's say list get item at index. And just go ahead and put in a 1 there. That would get the second phase. Let's try running that. It says run completed, so let's see what's going on here. I'm in phase three. It should be windows. 
It says the from list is null. I wonder if the to list is null. It gives me, it gives me the uh, room. It's giving you the room. So it's yeah. just not giving me the room. OK. Is anyone else getting a list of rooms there? Yeah. Two rooms is not, but the phone room is just giving you the room. Yeah, and I would expect that would be giving me something. I'm not sure why it's not giving me that. It's, oh, it's because I have this changed over to adaptive points, which is not very good. Sometimes it's right in front of you. So there we go. We have a list of the different rooms that are supporting all those different windows. Actually, I'm sort of curious about this. If I took this out and just put the list of phases in there, I'm sort of wondering if it'll give us a list of rooms in each of the, or windows in each of the phases. Nope. It gives you a null. It gives you a null there, too. OK, so it looks like we do need to go through and select a specific phase. Beautiful. OK, so there's a lot of things we could do to play around with just grabbing things, grabbing red elements, and doing interesting things. Now, I'm going to go back to the rooms, because that's really what I'm interested in, is grabbing all those items of type room. And what I want to do is get two values. I want to get the occupancy and the area for each of those things. So let me unclutter this diagram for just a little bit. I'll say, let's go ahead and get those rooms again. I'll just knock this out. Although that may come in handy again later. I'm going to grab these elements and say, let's pull it down and go through get parameter value by name. I'm going to get parameter occupancy. That's the one that we selected. And I'm also going to go through and get the parameter area. Let's see if I can get that. I'll say element over here, give it area. Okay, and Let's give this a run, because what I should do is now get a list of different rooms, different occupancies, and different areas for them. OK, so not looking too awfully bad. Let's see if we can connect that together. Yeah, that's not too bad looking. I'm getting empty lists where it says um, for the rooms. Let us see what we got. Okay, so it's phase one, empty list, empty list from room, elements, okay, we're doing the window category, all at once, the category, window, true, phase one, phase one, no, phase three, that should be five, come past. I'm not sure where we're getting this. This is interesting. Although we're doing that, we got the windows over there. I am not certain about what's going on there. That's kind of strange. Yeah, because it's got the windows, it's got the true. This all seems to be very good. All right, and you say you get the first one that just gives phase three, window in phase three from room. Um, in turn, can we go back and take a look at your rooms for a second, or go back to your Reddit model? Let's kind of shrink that down. Oh, try this. Flip that over, and flip that over. OK, now let's try it. a little bit different, although it's interesting you got it's the count. Oh, it's I see. It looks like the from, this is which, it's just empty, empty, and then that one's a from one. This is the two room. So yeah, I think it has something to do with what, the, which way the, the rooms are flipped. Like go to the two room instead. Or in the, um, should, I, should I come back up to that room? That looks like it's there, and that looks like it's there. Go back into the, uh, the dynamo graph. Try pulling from two room instead. I'm just sort of curious. Now run it. I run it completely with warnings. Mm -hmm. What else is going on? The warnings are probably happening somewhere else. Yeah, down here. Okay, actually coming down there. I'm not sure. What's, it's something to do with the order, although it looks like two of them, it understands two of them as being rooms it's going to. You know, you're sort of seeing this is for the different windows explicitly what the from and the to is considered. So I'm not sure like why the empty list, like, oh, what is it? It looks like most of them have the to value in it. Empty, that's from, yeah, it's a little strange. We have to just look at two rooms. Okay. okay, but for now, don't worry about that. Okay. We'll get back to that. 
Okay, so if you have some fantastic values for each of these, we are ready to start doing something. Here's what we're going to try and do. We want to use the data in the Excel file to, based upon these values, and these values where we got parameter value by name for the occupancy, and we have an area, we want to go through and look up two different things. We want to look at what color to make that room, and also what we need to divide the area through by to figure out how many people are each of those rooms. So that all happens a little bit lower in this graph. Let's take a look at that. You might remember writing to an Excel data file as not being too awfully bad. Here's what reading an Excel data file looks like. So what we are going to do is point it to some sort of file, and this is where you have to point it to the file on your machine as opposed to the file on my machine, because that URL is only valid for, for my machine. So go ahead and browse and see if you can find occupancy load table.xlsx. Take it to the specific file. Not very interesting right now. Just that specific file. Okay, we're going to tell it to read some Excel data from that file. And we have to give it a name, which sheet name it wants to be in. Excel files are a little lucky. They have different sheets and different rows and columns. So my type, uh, sheet name is occupancy load table. If you go back over to uh, Excel, you'd actually see that that's the name of the file out there. So if I go popping out there to Excel, you'll see it's occupancy load table. So okay. the sheet name or the file name? The, the file name is, actually in this case, that's bad because we're both the same name. The, when it says file from path, it's reading the file name, but then in the value sheet name, it's actually reading that part, the thing that's on the tab. Okay, so let's go back over to Dino and take a look at what that did. So I'm going to read that Excel data. If you try running that, you should get a big old array that looks like this. It's going to be a series of lists where the lists are basically every row followed by uh, the values in each of the different rows in the columns. You start to see the first row has a lot of text strings, occupancy, occupancy load pack, factor alpha, R, G, and D. Okay. Those are really what are called the header rows. So we just want to get rid of that because that's not actually valid data. So the next little function right next to it here just removes the header row. All we're really doing is list remove item at index. So I'm just going to say take that list and get rid of the zero with item. That will just knock off the header row. Mm -hmm. That will strip it out of there. So pull that on over. To go ahead and run that, we should get a list that looks very, very similar. It's just going to be the data values. Okay, not the header row. Okay, that's pretty good looking. Now, as we're looking at this, this is pretty much a series of rows, the way it's sort of set up in the table right now. Mechanical in the first column, 300, 0, 139, 166, 178. What I want to do is actually grab those values in a systematic way. And the way that it will make the most sense is actually to, it's what I'll call flip it a little bit. What I want to do is basically um, grab all the values that are in the same place to go through and figure out you know, what the colors are, what a list of all the different uh, like uh, occupancies are, what a list of all the different occupancy load factors are. So you can see what I really want to do is I want to grab mechanical circulation office. I want to get the zeroth element from every list. I want to get the first element from every list, the second. I want to get them all together really as a series of different little sublists, little tables that I could look up in. So what I want to do is actually just reorganize the list into columns by doing a transpose. So if I transpose the list, it uh, just changes it around a little bit. So now I grabbed all of the mechanical, or all the names, it had all the occupancy load values, and it had finally um, just the values of R, G, and B. 
So let's talk about what we're going to do with this data. Here's the deal. We want to go through and actually look up some values. And look up is kind of a strange thing in terms of how we actually get it to work. Okay. If you think about how a lookup works, what we typically do is we go on down the first column, we go through looking for a value that has a kind of match to what we're interested in, and then based upon the row number that we find the matching value in, we go over a couple of columns and find like a, what we're interested in. And that's really what it's all about doing here. What I want to do here is take all these different values, and I'm really going to sort of pull them out column-wise, okay, so that I can go through and start doing some lookups. And the way that's going to work is I'm going to take this list that has all these different values, I'm going to say, let's just get the zero list, and that's going to be the list of all the names. Then I'm going to get the first list, and that's going to be the list of all the occupancies. And finally, three, four, five, or two, three, four, and five, those are the colors. So for this, what I'm interested in doing is, let's go ahead and just grab that list. I'm going to feed it up into this one, that one. Just feed it into all of them, where I am just pulling off, oh, by feeding it different indexes, get in, or the list item at the index, which in turn, Oh, say again? For compute the RGB colors associated with each occupancy name, don't you want to feed that the list of occupancy names at the top? We're going to do that in just a second. We're going to do the match. This is actually just going to pull them out and kind of make the colors. And then you know, we're going to take the ones that are actually from the true Revit model and match them against it based on position. Okay, so this is it's kind of this funny notion you're creating a dictionary where sort of based on keys in the dictionary where the key is going to be the occupancy name, you match, and then you pull values that are in the same location. Okay, so it's actually sort of a good general purpose concept, but let's see how it actually sort of works. If you go through and you run this so far, you'll see that for the first part over here where we grab the zero value, we just have the name. That's going to be the keys that we're going to look up against. This is the occupancy load values. So after I look up for a key and I find office, I'll say, oh, office is at the second position. So I'll look up in the occupancy load values and say the second position has a value of 100. So I'll use 100 for that matching one. OK, these colors, it's actually pretty similar, although we just need to combine the colors together. I have alphas, which are a whole bunch of zeros. I have some red values, some green values, and some blue values. So if you string those all together, what this is going to do is just give us a list of different colors. Oh, you just use that to create values here, right? Yes. That's all I'm doing down there. It's, I'm just RGBing them together. And so now what's going to happen is mechanical zero has 300 of the occupancy low value. And it has a color 139, 166, and so on. Yeah. So, for example, a mechanical is, it has an occupancy of 150. Let, let's assume that I, I put in a smaller area of the mechanical room. Yes. It will automatically prorate the color according to the RGB value. Actually, in this case, it won't, because what it'll do here is just going to go mechanical is item 0, so it'll pick color 0. OK. okay. Although we could do a scaling factor like that. But now, so it's just going to be, it would factor in that when we figured out the number of people, it would divide by 150 as opposed to 300. So we get more people in the room. Okay. So here it's just kind of directly mapped. Okay. But we could put it in sliding scale. That'd be kind of interesting. Kind of like how heavily loaded is the room. Okay, so how's it going over here? I'm just not getting the list of rooms. Look. Let us see what's going on. We got the zero if we got that. Oh, we still just need to pull from this list way up to there. Okay, so maybe we go zero with item. Okay, so mechanical zero, 300 zero, color zero. That's what we're trying for. It's just like matching them up. And again, what we really just created is just a little dictionary out of like uh, this Excel file. 
kind of weird how much work it is to go through and convince you know, Dynamo to do something that you would do to pretty intuitively. Like if I gave you this and said, okay, you know, what is the occupancy value associated with break room? You know how to get that really quickly. Okay, but that's all we're really teaching it to do. Or for office, what is the RGB value? Oh, okay, I'll go to this row and I'll grab these and kind of make an RGB color out of that. Okay, so that's all it's really doing. So we have completed the first step. We've gone ahead and we've gotten those model values in the Excel data file, and we've organized that Excel data file for use, okay, by just sort of making kind of everything that we're all set to sort of start looking things up. So next, we're going to set the room color based on the occupancy. I'm going to start with the color first. That's kind of an easy one. What we're going to do is, for each of those different rooms, we're going to create a funny function that actually creates solids out of each of those different rooms. It just actually says, here's the volume, give me a solid that is the same as that volume, so I can colorize it. Then I'm going to look up the desired color from that table of colors based upon the occupancy. And finally, we're just going to overwrite the color to do that. So if you can join me in step two, we'll go ahead and make that happen. So come on over to... Let's come out to two, eh? And I got some new notes for you. So, so far, oh, this part should look about the same as it did before. We're just looking at the values. Although, for you, go ahead and set the file path, or set, you know, so that it's pointing to your file again. It's probably going to give you an error since it's still pointed to my file. Let us show you where all the action happens. All the action is happening up at the top. We're going to do a couple different things. One is we're going to take all those rooms and what we're going to do is, hey, for each of those elements, go through and create a solid out of it. What the solid is doing is really just creating a volume which sort of matches whatever you feed it. So we're going to take the rooms, we're going to say make a solid out of it. Then we're going to go through and make an import instance. The solid is going to go ahead and make it here in Dynamo. The import instance by geometry will make it happen in Revit. It will actually put something in there that's a Revit object. Okay. So if you want to sort of just do that step at a time, I could even break it right here and say let's just take those rooms and run that, you'll see what it's doing in Dynamo in the background here is it's just created a whole bunch of different solids, so geometric solids to represent the geometry. So that's what it looks like. Okay, Those don't yet exist in Revit. They only exist in Dynamo in our mathematical space. So if I actually want to make those happen in Revit too as solids, See, I'll switch over here to Revit, go back to 3D. Oops. Looks like I may have some in there already. Actually, no, what it, was that? Is it unconnected? It is unconnected. That. What happens, I still have the solids from the last time I did this. So mm -hmm. what you can do to kind of get rid of that is this. Go over to the uh, view that says show masses only. There's just the masses. And we can now go through and like uh, highlight those and get rid of them. Although, interesting, I didn't save the last ones. Go ahead and highlight, but before you get rid of it, let's do a filter, because I don't want to get the doors. <laughs> Leave the doors and windows in there. Um, say again? Or the other way it is is if I say VG, what I want to do is, uh, I want to turn off windows and doors. Shoot, shoot when you like, like, the project browser, look at the project browser, shoot, the 3D views. Oh, for show masses only? It's, yeah, over here in the project browser, I have a view that says this show masses only. Okay, 
Now, I wanted to, uh, I actually hid the doors and windows. I don't want to get rid of those, because what I want to do is just get rid of these masses. And what is happening is those sort of white boxes, those are the masses that are in Revit. The orange that you're seeing, that's a preview of what it's showing in Dynamo right now. Okay, so I had just a whole series of different masses over here, they're kind of hanging out. I had to get rid of the old ones just because the last time I saved this file, I had uh, already created some masses. But hopefully you can look at something that just looks sort of like this. And if you would like to go through and actually generate the masses to match your current geometry, just go ahead and reconnect those solids created in Dynamo to the masses. And when you run that, it should create all the little white boxes over here. So now there's actually two things there. There's a preview and there's the white box. Okay, so let's pause there for a second because the next thing we're going to do is actually try to give those boxes colors based upon uh, the occupancy. So this part of the example actually came from it's something some of the folks in PBL wanted to do last year at Global AEC. They were looking to go through and create 3D color maps, kind of like doing, uh, it's almost like a color legend in a floor plan, only we're trying to do it in 3D to go ahead and uh, have a 3D representation of the uh, mapping of the different functions in a building. So let's talk about, uh, let's pause everything. How are we doing on terms of solids? You got those solids kind of hanging around in there? Beautiful. Okay, now here is the trickiest thing we're going to do today. It is right over here, and it's the part that Claire was asking about just a moment ago. There is a fabulous function. It's called list match with key values. And let's talk about how it works, because this is the funny part. Okay, what you're going to do is you're going to feed it a sequence. That's all the different things that I can possibly go through and select from. Okay. Then I'm going to feed it a series of keys. That is basically a key that I want to look up in the sequence and find the position where it's located. Okay. The third value, the third thing I hear is values. That is, after you've found the position, return the thing from the value list, which is at the same position as the key. Okay. So in lookup, it's always It'll look down the column for the value, and then it'll go over and find the corresponding value. OK, so if you can handle that, you got it today. Because that's actually the strangest thing we're going to do. And it's actually probably one of the trickier things we've been uh, kind of to do in terms of list management. But here's what we're going to do. We are going to uh, go through and feed in all the different rooms. Actually, we're going to feed in basically all the room names. We're going to feed in the keys. Actually, I got to do this right. Nope. We're going to feed in the room names from the. Uh, I'm going to do it in the backwards order. I know I am. I'm going to feed in the room names, which are the possibilities. That's the dictionary, which is out of the Excel file. I'm going to feed in as keys the room name or the occupancies from the actual Revit model. It'll find where they are in the data dictionary. And then for the values, I'm going to feed in the colors that are at those same positions so I can look up those from the uh, like Excel data file. So how that's going to work again is for sequence, okay, this is basically the dictionary of values you want to match against. So what I'm going to match against is it's this list of names. Okay, this is basically my dictionary right there. In terms of the values, I'm going to match against that dictionary. It is this list of values. It is the list of values that are actually the room names that came out of the model. I'm going to pop that over a little bit. And finally, what are the values? So what it's going to do is it's going to come down here. It's going to say conference. OK. On my list over here, it is item number three. Therefore, I need to find item three in another list. And the list that I'm going to find item three in is the color list. So I'll pull in the list of colors. 
like the sequence yeah. is what you're importing from Excel, right? So what what you're trying to do, uh, what you're trying to map with respect to any variable is what it is. Yes, it's a um, se sequence is really it's the dictionary you're looking up against is the way the best the best way to sort of think about it. So and those values came out of Excel. So again, see if I can pull in, because again, this is the weirdest part. We're going to look up based upon these values. Our dictionary is really the list of value room occupancies okay, from Excel. We're going to plug in the values to look up as being the values in every individual room that we found in the model. And then what we want to actually report out as the thing we did look up is the list of colors. So let's try getting those hooked together and see if we can get the list of colors out. Okay, again, what we're looking up against, these are the values we're looking up in that table, and then based upon the matching values, so if it matches the five and four, it's going to look up color four. Okay, let's check it out. We'll go through and give it a run. I'm getting a null right now. Let me kind of think about this for just a second in terms of where I messed up. What's that? The sequencing keys. Yeah. I'm backwards on those? Oh, that makes sense. OK. <laughs> Thank you. So the sequence is instead, that is the value we're, those are the values we're looking up. Well, that actually makes sense even in terms of uh, what the way you know the way you describe it that sounds better okay so we're looking up that sequence of values against this series of keys so this sequence of values against that series of keys based upon the value it's going to go through and pull some values and pull those across okay let's try that excellent so what you would expect to see happening here is for conference and mechanical, the first two values that we looked at in the sequence, they're kind of a little bit unique. Two, three, four, all the way through seven, they're all offices. So I'd expect that two, three, four, to all the way through seven have the same color, because it looked up the same color associated with each of those. Okay, down here at the bottom, uh, what is it? restroom mechanical. We're actually sort of unique after that. So we have some different color values kind of floating around in here. But theoretically, we have a list of color values that it's sort of mapping against all those. OK, if you have a bunch of color values, let's stop and kind of pause and make sure everyone has color values. Do you want a list of color values? You doing good, Ms. Lemma? Ms. Jacqueline? You got some nice color values? Excellent. What's got on there? You got that. Still says no, let's figure it out. Okay, because it may be, I screwed it up at first, and yes, let's go ahead and change it. So takes this as the sequence instead. I have the order wrong, so let's get the, this value here, the name values. Let's go ahead and pull them in as sequence. And then for the keys instead, we'll pull in this. So I have those back, and yeah, backwards in my way of describing it. Okay, so if you got a bunch of color values and you want to associate them, I got color values, I got solids, I bet you can override some colors in view. And if you do that, just go ahead and grab those color values and grab the objects you want to override and let's put them together. So the elements are going to be all these geometry elements. The colors are going to be the ones we just looked up. Okay, give that a run, and with any luck, we should get a nice little color graph in the background there. Check it out. What's that? Pale. Yes. You might 
guess I like blues and greens. <laughs> What's your warning say? It says converting the array to DLC code or uh, will not cause any array rank reduction. Let us see what's going on back here. So you got some RGB colors. Although I have an empty list, that kind of worries me down there. Yeah, that's because of the Oh, there's nothing like that in the uh, list over there. Cool. Oh, it's actually, it's, it's not even the name there. Go to the occupancy, which is actually just choose that. Okay, that's so, so choose the room object. Okay, and then uh, let's look at the properties. Where's your properties? Good of you. And uh, user interface, say properties. Okay, and under occupancy, right there. Go ahead and give that. Say R right there. So we can Okay, and now I think you'll find something. Okay. Okay, so if you have some nice colorized values, we're actually in pretty good shape. Okay, let us do this. Uh, oh, oh. Just have you guys vote one way or the other. Uh, do you want to take a break or do you want to keep going? I'd go either way. With that, take a break. Okay. Come on back in five then, and when you come on back in five, we're going to apply this very same sort of logic and infrastructure to say, colors were cool, but what if we actually compute the values and do something useful with that? Okay, and that's what we'll do after the break. Yeah, useful.